Well, good morning, church. Good morning, Laura, come back out here real quick. She's not in trouble. I wanted to take a moment right here. Step, step up. She, she's like in and out all the time. Backstage, always in black. Laura has been with us since the very beginning of the church. I remember Saturday morning prayer one time. I remember watching Laura leave and go get on a bike and ride home in the rain. I was like, do you need a ride? She's like, no, I love to ride my bike and I love the rain. I'll be fine. And, and I remember just how much it meant to me and Stephanie to see people like you believe in our church and you've, you've served, you've given, you've done everything so faithfully. And Laura is, is moving to a new season of ministry into a new place in our, in our country. And I just want you to know that, that we love you uh, we, we love what God's calling you to do, and then I just want you to know that our team here at Action Church is so important. If you see them or if you don't see them, there are people, hundreds of people like Laura at all of our locations making a difference for Jesus Christ in Central Florida. So we love you. We're going to miss you. Can you give it up for Laura this morning? Thank you so much. I need a hug. Standing ovation. Man. Oh, man, my wife preached way better than me already, and I cried. <laughs> this is not going to be a highlight sermon, just bear with me. Last week was great, and you guys didn't even appreciate it. This one may not be so great, so just help me out, help me out. Week three of On Your Mark, we've been in, in a series uh, starting in, in mid-August as we enter this fall season, as we enter this back-to-school season, really as we enter into this new season as a church. I don't know if you were with us last week or uh, you saw on social media, but we announced that we are, are launching our, our fourth location in Winter Park coming in spring of 2018. And it's not something that we were planning. Uh, we were ready for it. What you need to know about Action Church is that we steward well and we, we invest our time and resources and then we wait for God to open up the doors of opportunity. We were not looking for this opportunity, but God gave us a great opportunity with 21 and a half acres and 30,000 square feet of existing facilities that we can renovate at a fraction of the cost it would have, would have cost us to build uh, with raw land and a, and a new building. And so we're really excited and there's a new season coming for our church of growth and what God is doing right here at Winter Springs, at Oviedo, and at Sanford through salvations and decisions and stories. It's just pretty remarkable. And so I wanted to take these three weeks, and I wanted us to just get ready. When you're getting ready for a race, you know, you say, on your mark, get set, go. And I wanted us as a church to be on our mark. I wanted you and your family to be on your mark. I wanted you and your business to be on your mark, that you are ready to run the race that God has for you. We've been using this theme verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. If you remember week one, we talked about being stuck in the starting blocks. If some of us are carrying a weight that we were never meant to carry, some of us are, are, are stuck in some wrong thinking. And we decided that if we're going to get unstuck, if we're going to run the race that God has for us, that we're going to have to surrender some things. That the Bible, uh, a lot of times, is counter cultural, it's counterintuitive what we would think in our own fleshly brain. That it, it, we need to surrender to move forward, that we need to surrender our priorities. Parties. We need to surrender our past. We need to surrender our, our thought process. Week two, we talked about running the race well. And what is the race? The race is to run after God and to run after people. Amen. And last week, we, we coined a phrase here at Action Church that I think is going to take us through this season, but probably the life of the church. And it was, it's not about me. It's about the mission. And you know what's crazy? When you, when you preach truth, the Bible is called a, a, a double-edged sword. What happens is it cuts going in and it cuts coming out. And it divides truth from untruth. And it's amazing to me, church, at all of our locations, how last week I heard hundreds, if not thousands of stories of people that said, I want to live on mission. And I celebrate that, that we're going to say no to me and we're going to say yes to mission. But what I also heard was some me. 
And when we talk about it, sometimes we decide and we figure out that we are all too concerned with me. And I just want to challenge you that when me raises its head in your marriage, when me raises its head in your ministry, when me begins to raise its head in your spirit and you start thinking about how things affect you, you need to kill that. You need to crush that. You need to remove that because as Christians, it's not about me. It's about the mission. Today I want to finish our series together talking about this this term endurance. Everybody say endurance. Endurance. Come on to our location, say endurance. 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 How do we run with endurance the race that God has for us? How do we not just sprint? It's easy to sprint. Man, if you didn't sprint out of here last week and tell somebody about Jesus, if you didn't sprint out of here last week and and figure out how you're going to serve more or give more, then this probably isn't the place for you. It is easy to get excited on a Sunday. It is easy to get excited with a new book, with a date night. It is easy to start the race. I want to talk about today how we run the race well with endurance that we don't begin to tire out and get fatigued and wander off or withdraw ourselves from the race. How do we hear, well done, good and faithful servant? How do we finish the race? Well, we run it with endurance. Here's what we need. We need three things. If you're taking notes today, you can write down these and study them this week. We need three things to run our race well, to run with endurance. The first one is we need someone to help us set the pace. In a race with cars, it's the pace car, right? The pace car sets the pace. It gets everybody in order. If you've ever ran a marathon, you have those annoying people that are way more fit than you. They run with a a stick with a time on it, and they're like, this is the three-and-a-half-hour pace, and this is the four-hour pace, and they're holding something, and they've got water, and they've got a clipboard and a costume on, and they're running faster than you. (laughs) They're setting the pace for you. They are a pace Setter, if you are going to run your life well with endurance, you need a pace setter in your life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about somebody to follow. It says in this verse in Hebrews 12, it says, since you are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses. What's it talking about? It's talking about the characters in the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews is saying, since you are surrounded by so many witnesses, so many men and women who have gone before you, it says, look to what they have done. Hey, church, we don't have to figure out everything to do in our finances. We don't have to figure out everything to do in our faith journey. We don't have to figure out everything to do in our marriages. We're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses, men and women that have gone before us that we can learn from their wins and we can learn from their losses. If you're struggling with a a family problem today, well, I suggest that you go look to the the person in the crowd, the, the witness in the crowd in the Old Testament. His name was Joseph. I can pretty much guarantee at all of our locations that ain't nobody gone through what Joseph has gone through. Just walking out, just wearing a a nice little new coat that his father made him, and all of a sudden he's in a cistern, beaten up by his brothers and sold into slavery. I don't know if I did, but show of hands, but that's probably never happened to anybody. If it is, it's an amazing story. You should tell it. We'll put it on a video. It'll really help. You got family problems? Go, Go look at what Joseph did. He didn't complain. He didn't get down. He knew God had a purpose in every prison cell, in every, every detour, in every place where people from the outside would have looked and said, why are you there? He saw it as an opportunity to progress into the promise that God had, had made him, and he became one of the most important people in the world through the trial and through the relational difficulty. Don't look just to your situation. Look to the crowd of witnesses. You find yourself in a situation that is too big for you, why don't you go and study the life of Moses? Somebody that had murdered someone, that had a speech impediment, that was called to go before Pharaoh, the most important man in the world, and deliver speeches to persuade him to let God's people go. You ever been overwhelmed by the call of God in your life? Go study the life of Moses and his faith journey as he walked out the call God had for him and lived and ran his race well. You feel tempted by society, you feel tempted by things going on in your life, tempted to stray from the word of God and what God says a a man or woman should be in this generation. Why don't you go study the life of Daniel? 
a man that was, was in captivity, that was underneath Nebuchadnezzar's rule and was, was, was literally ordered to, to lay down his beliefs and to, to, to begin to walk a different path, a, a sinful path. And we're going to study for the next six weeks, starting the second week of September, the life of Daniel, a series called Identity. What do we do when culture shifts? What do we do when the world says one thing and the Bible says a different thing? And we're going to take six weeks because, hey, church, this isn't new. <laughs> God's not surprised by the state of the world, and it's not the first time that it's happened. It's happened before, and there are people in Scripture. There is a crowd of witnesses that we can look to to model our lives after. We need to look to the Scriptures. If we're going to have somebody set the pace for us, we need to do this. We need to surrender our life to God. And we need to submit ourselves to some spiritual authority. You know, I hear so many times, I see it on Facebook, I hear all the time, you know, I just, I just listen to God, I don't listen to people. And that's great when you're talking about the crowd, and that's great when you're, when you're talking about your priority. You should listen to God first, but God called us to do life with other people. And all throughout Scripture, he used men and women to communicate his word, and he used relationships and specifically spiritual authority to, to begin to guide people into what he has for them. You know, as a pastor all the time, I, I sit in my office or uh, on the front row or meet people out front, and they begin to come up and, and, and start a conversation, and they're looking for biblical advice. <laughs> they're looking for a strategy. They're looking for an answer. The problem is they're not asking any questions. And I ask this question all the time, are you, are you asking me for wisdom? Or are you asking me to bless the decision that you've already made? <laughs> If that's the case, then go, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, see you in heaven. You know what I mean? Like, if we're not in relationship, if I'm not your pastor, if the small group leader is not your leader, if you're not submitted to authority, then why are we having the conversation? I promise you freedom comes when you surrender your life to Jesus and you plant yourself in a local life-giving church and you submit yourself to biblical, spiritual authority. It just helps. It doesn't make sense to our democratic mindset, but it is a kingdom mindset, and it's all throughout Scripture. I'm just here to tell you, if you want to run your race with endurance, you need to begin to follow some people. You need to begin to, to put your life in, in, in the hands of other people, and you're going to get hurt, and they're going to make mistakes, but I think that's all part of the growing process. It's what God commands us to do, surrender and to submit. We need people to help us set the pace. You know, when I look at, at my marriage, when I look at our parenting, when I look at businesses that I've led, when I look at our church, I don't try and figure out everything on my own. I look to people that have done it well, and I send text messages, and I pay for dinners, and I fly all over the country to say, hey, you're doing it better than me. Can I take you to lunch? Can I ask you some questions? Can I begin to let you set a new pace for this journey that I'm on? Find people to help you. Submit your life to other people. You know, a lot of times we don't like the way our life looks, but we're following the wrong examples. Since you're surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses. Church, I think that's biblical. I think we should use the Bible. I think we should look back at the Old Testament. We should look at the New Testament. We should look at the life of Paul and the life of Moses and the life of, of Joseph and Daniel. We should look at the life of Jesus. And that should be the most important. And don't misunderstand me. We should look here first, the huge crowd of witnesses that have gone before us. But did you know at a church our size, there's also a huge crowd of witnesses in these seats that can help you run the race that God has called you to run? Like there's a huge crowd of witnesses. There are people that have witnessed God's faithfulness through a tough time in their marriage. There are people that have witnessed God's faithfulness bring them through a season of unbelief. There are people that have witnessed God break them free from addiction. And now they're leading other people to experience the same life change. Don't do life alone when you have a huge crowd of witnesses in Scripture and next to you in your road that can help you run your race with endurance. You gotta have somebody help set the pace. We need someone to help set the pace in our life. The second one is we need someone to help maintain the pace. We need someone to help us maintain the pace. We need some friends. Everybody say friends. 
It says, let us, let us strip off, let us, let, us, let us get rid of every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You know, sometimes we're not aware of the sin. And I want to put it real, uh, uh, real practical for you. You need people to help you maintain the pace. You need people to help you run well. You need people to let you know that you run weird sometimes. <laughs> like I've, you drive down Tuscaloosa, you will see some weird runners. You got like the shuffle, like you're like, you're not, I'm not even sure that's doing anything. Like you got the, you got the power walkers, like the, you know what I'm talking about? You got the people that look like they're going to, on, on death's door. <laughs> You got the people that bounce and just flail their arms everywhere, like walking around like Conor McGregor, but they're running, you know what I mean? Like they're just, they're everywhere. You need somebody to say, hey, you shouldn't run in public. I'm going to buy you a treadmill. You're embarrassing yourself and everybody that knows you. (laughs) You need friends to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. But the term friend is evolving. You know, our friendship is, is changing. I found some stats this week that, that friends is evolving. The average American adult has 328 friends on Facebook. 328. 328 friends that like your post and you interact with and you direct message and all. 20, 328 friends. The same survey found that in 2017, the average American had, would say they have two close friends in real life. 328 in a virtual world, in an internet society, two real friends. That's down from six real friends 25 years ago. The average American would say they had six people that they were close to. And 20% of those surveyed said they had zero friends at all. We need people to help us maintain the pace, but that term friend is evolving. It's not actually a close relationship. It's not actually a brother or sister. It's not actually somebody that would would walk through something with us. It's just somebody that would like our post on Facebook and interact with us from a distance. The problem with the way your friendship is evolving online is that we're, we're, we're beginning to seek this thing called, it's called immediate affirmation. That I need to live my life for immediate affirmation. That if I post something, that I just wait and see how many people like it. And if you like it, I love you. And if you comment on it, I really love you. And if you, if you share it, you're my bestie. And if you, if, you, if you put a heart on it, you're my bae. And if you, all of these things, and it's... It's that immediate affirmation, and what it does is this term scientists are calling, it's deferred loneliness. That we're so empty and we're so alone, 20% of people would say they have no friends. The majority of people would say they only have two close friends. But we defer that loneliness by getting on the internet and having this immediate affirmation that begins to fix the symptom, but doesn't fix the root of the problem. That I have this need to be loved, that I have this need to be affirmed, that I have this need to know that somebody cares about me. And the void is real, and the void is not going anywhere, but we medicate it with immediate affirmation. And scientists are actually saying there's a, there's a chemical dopamine that's released in your brain that's addictive, that it's, it's becoming, that we're getting so used to the immediate affirmation that some of us are not even seeking real affirmation anymore. We're just pursuing a counterfeit. It sounds to me like the enemy to take something that God gave us as a, a friend, as a, as a relationship, as people that would help us maintain the pace and to trade it in for a counterfeit of 328 people that don't actually care about what you're doing. They're just liking your post so you'll like their post and they're just on there trying to make themselves feel better as well. No, we need real friends. We need real friends. The friend term is evolving. We need to meet affirmation. I'll give you one more thought here before we move on. This, this friendship on the internet, this social media friendship, it's friendship in 2017. We've turned friendship into, it's friendship on our own terms. That's why we don't like to call anybody anymore. We don't like to meet because we may be forced into a conversation. If we just text, we're in control. I don't have to text you back. If I'm really angry, I'll start the text and let those three dots just sit there for a couple of days. 
It's mean. It's rude. It's a special place in hell for those people that do that. I'm just kidding. But maybe. Maybe. I'm not God. We're in control. I can like your post or I can not like your post. I have control over you. It's friendship on our own terms. And friendship on your own terms is not friendship at all. It's giving yourself to someone else. We need real friends because life can be tough. Have you ever felt weighed down by life? Have you ever felt that you're just, you just you can't carry it anymore? Like in, in your relationships, in your marriage, in your business, the stress that you're carrying, that I, I just can't do this anymore. I need, I need a couple people. I need, I need three guys to come up here with me. I want to I show this. Just three people. Come on. Come on. It doesn't matter. Just come on. Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, Evan. I was just standing right here in the line, okay? You guys shoulder to shoulder. This is gonna be a little difficult. This is perfect. This will work perfect. Adapt. I'm gonna adapt right here. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan. Man, Dylan, are you serving Action Kids right now? Come on, Dylan. Dylan's serving in Action Kids. How old are you, Dylan? Dylan is 12 and serving Jesus. What are you doing with your life? Awesome. Dylan is representing all of us. Dylan is, uh, it, 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 it's heavy. School is stressful. He's so got some friends' issues. He's got some stuff going on, and life is heavy. You guys just step out of the way for a second. If it's just Dylan, man, he is going to be broad. It's right. These shoulders are not going to carry all of the weight that Dylan has to carry. In his school, in his home, in the race that God has for him. These things, these things are swole. I can tell you work out, Dylan. You are crushing life. That shirt barely fits. We need to get you a bigger size. But these things are not going to be able to carry the weight of the world. They're not going to be able to carry all of the relational baggage. They're not going to be carry all of the stress. They're not going to be able to carry everything. That's why we're not called to do life alone. Because when it gets heavy, come here, Evan. When it gets heavy, he can link arms with one of his friends and they can get down on his level and meet him where they are. And look what we just did. We just doubled our capacity to carry the things in our life. That's why it says if you feel attacked, can you, can you grab someone? Ecclesiastes says if you can be attacked, but two can stand back to back. Two can stand beside each other and they can conquer anything because they are protecting each other and they are carrying weight. It says can you grab a third? Come on over here. A third. Now we've tripled our capacity to carry the weight of the world. Don't do life alone. Don't do life alone. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Can you give him a hand? Dylan crushed it. Dylan, find a substitute in action. Kids, come with me on the second service today. <laughs> we need real friends because I, I have weeks where I feel alone and I feel like I can't carry it and I can call somebody. If you don't have somebody that knows everything about you, you are in a dangerous, dangerous place. My pastor always says, he says, you're only as sick as your secrets. And if there's somebody that doesn't know what you struggle with, if there's somebody that doesn't know your weaknesses, if there's somebody that doesn't know that if there was an area that you were going to fall, this would be it. And if they're not there linking arms with you and helping support you, you are one step away from stupid. And we need real friends. We need friends that are going to tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. And can I just tell you, we... We serve a real God who is all-powerful, and at the end of the day, we know that he wins. The war has been won. But can I tell you that too many Christians are losing the battle because they're surrounding themselves with people that are telling them what they want to hear. I've got situations in my life so close to me and so personal to me that, that they are surrounding themselves with the voices that encourage their sin and encourage their comfort and encourage them to do things that feel good and encourage them to, to listen to what they want to hear. Can I just tell you, the enemy will always whisper in your ear what you want to hear. You need Christians. You need a church. You need somebody to help you maintain the pace by telling you what you need to hear. That what you're doing is wrong. 
and it's separating you from God, but there's a better way. We need people to help us set the pace. We need to help us help need people to help us maintain the pace. Thirdly, we need people. We need someone to help. <laughs> you're like, did you not finish the statement? No, I finished it. Like, if you're going to be healthy, if you're going to run with endurance, you need somebody to follow, you need somebody to link arms with, and you need to look, somebody to look back and say, hey, you're doing okay. You can run with me. You can follow me. You can draft with me. I will, I will, I will, I will cut the pace. I will blaze the trail. Just step in for a little while, and we'll run this race together. Church, you need someone to help. I wrote this down this week, and I don't want to mess it up because it was really, it was the moment. It was the, the revelation for me in the message. It says this. Sometimes we don't need another remedy for the past, but a reason to live differently for the future. Some of you are not going to get free by looking back. You're going to get free by looking forward to what God has for you in your future and not what the enemy stole in your past. You need someone to help. That if you're walking through something tough and you just got freedom, no, I'm not telling you to go back to the bar or go back to the relationship. I'm telling you to get freedom and then look for people to set free in Jesus' name. I'm telling you to go to a freedom group, experience freedom, and then lead a freedom group. I'm telling you to go to a marriage group, experience a healthy marriage, and start a marriage group. I'm telling you to go to a team and serve the team and, and be, be pastored and mentored by a team leader. I'm telling you to start a new team. I'm saying if you are going to live the life God has called you to live one day, it has to stop being about you and has to become about the mission, and you need to find people to help. We need someone to help. And I'm just telling you today that step four, joining our team, is not something that we need. It's something that you need. There's an opportunity for you to take your eyes off of you. And even, even in some pain and even in some things that still need to be worked through, to begin to take your eyes off of you and put them on Jesus. And begin to take your eyes off of you and put them on the needs of other people. Can I just tell you the most fulfilling thing that I get to do is to see people like Laura and see people wearing a blue shirt and to see people wearing our highlighter yellow shirt so they don't get killed by you crazy drivers in the parking lot, serve in their place. Can I just tell you that I believe this with all of my heart, that every person that serves at Action Church, whether it be in a small group, whether it be through faithful tithing, whether it be through setting up or tearing down at Winter Springs or at Haggerty, whether it be serving on Saturday in Sanford with Pastor Kenneth at, at, at our block party, that everybody on the team gets an equal reward in heaven for what we're a part of. This isn't about me. This is the body of Christ. I get to be the mouthpiece for a few years, but there are feet and there are hands and there are people that go into the community and hold babies. Ain't nobody really want to hold your baby while you're in here, but there's people back there serving, giving their life, maybe literally right now, laying down their life so that you could come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm just telling you, you will not be fulfilled living for yourself. I don't care how many cars you have, how many houses you have, how much church attendance you have, until you start giving your life away, you will never experience the endurance and the breath of air and the empowerment of God to finish well until you live for other people. We need someone to help. We need someone to help. At Action Church, we, we have those opportunities. Today is step four. We don't ever do anything without a system. If we tell you to invite, we're going to give you a shareable graphic on social media. If we tell you to invite, we're going to give you an invite card. If we tell you relationships are important, we're going to give you a way to get into relationships. Today at all of our locations, we're going to have small group launch. You can go out and sign up for a small group. Get involved in relationships. You can, you can plug into a healthy community that will change your life. Small groups will change your life. And you may be thinking right now, well, it's small group launch weekend, and you're paid to say that. And you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It was strategic. We are definitely promoting small groups today. But that's why I don't want you to take my word for it. I don't want you to take my word for the power of relationships, the power of groups in our church and in our life, the power of finding somebody to help set the pace, maintain the pace, and then someone to help. Why don't you take a look at a story of life change from a, a, a couple in our church that saw their life changed in Freedom Group and now are making a difference at Action Church.
Uh, we've been married for just over eight years and together for just over nine. Uh, we have two children, Bree, who is uh, almost 11, and Brody, who's seven. Um, both of our kids play ball for um, Winter Springs Babe Ruth, and Pastor Justin was doing the opening prayer for the season. Michael, I think, was on shift that day, and so I called him, and I was like, um, I think we're going to try out a new church next weekend, and he's like, um, no, we're not. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, we are. And um, I won, we did, and we have never left. <laughs> Spring of 2016, um, small group launch weekend um, had come and they had a freedom group and everyone had talked about how amazing the groups are and everything. And Michael's um, struggled a lot with his work. I've been a firefighter for 11 years now. I just realized that, you know, over the years, there was a couple of calls that we'd run, you know, mainly dealing with children that um, had stayed with me. And, I didn't sleep at night. Like I used to wake up three, four times a night, and every time I'd wake up, I'd have to go and look at my kids and just make sure that they were okay. So I signed us up for a freedom group, mainly because I knew Michael needed to go through it and just hoping that it would be something amazing for him. Um, but little did I know that God was putting me right where I needed it to be when I needed it the most. We were probably about halfway through freedom group, weeks. four weeks in, and I was at the fire department coming off shift that morning. My mom had called me at like 6.30 that morning. I tried calling her back and she didn't answer and trying to figure out what's going on. And then as finally about an hour later, she finally called me back and she told me that I needed to come over because my dad had just been arrested for child pornography. So the first few weeks were, were pretty rough and just trying to find out why and where my mom would go from here, you know, 38 year marriage. and this big secret and so there's a lot to wondering like how much of your life is a lie. I do a job for a career where we show up to a, something bad and we try and make it good and I couldn't do anything. I kept just saying God take over because I, I can't do this on my own. I think we both ended up calling someone from our freedom groups. They all sent text messages letting us know, like, we're here for you, we're praying for you, is there anything you need? Two weeks after everything happened, we had reached the forgiveness section. And I remember going in and, like, obviously dreading it. Could I find forgiveness for my father, um, especially so soon? I sat there and I said, like, how can I, like, I, I can't picture forgiving somebody that just did this. I was mad. Like, I was mad. And uh, I couldn't. I couldn't watch her be upset, like, a whole, lot, a whole lot more and not be able to do something. And so then I started praying about it, and I got to the point where I realized that the one thing that I can do that can help her is I can forgive her father, and I can make something better of this. I think we left group that night and I had decided that um, I needed to go and visit my dad. It was the first, I hadn't seen him yet since everything happened. Um, I made an appointment and a week after that week I had gone and visited my dad for the first time and saw him eye to eye and um, just let him know like I did forgive him. Even though we still didn't have the answers. But... And so um, that one visit actually led into me going every single week to visit my dad. And once he got his sentencing and found out he was going to be um, transferred to state prison, um, I sat and prayed a prayer of salvation with my dad over a payphone <laughs> and brought him back into a relationship with the Lord. So. So the whole time during our freedom group, everyone said, you have to go to freedom retreat. You have to go to freedom retreat. We went and it was amazing. When you walked in, you knew that it was like, this is a special place right now. So each session covered the topics, you know, that you already covered throughout the study, but then you would go up to the prayer line and, um, and kind of just, that was where you had a chance to release it. Just the, the weight was just lifted off your shoulders after every single session. Every session, you went back to your chair just feeling lighter and lighter. There's no doubt that God had us. He, got, he brought us to Action Church. He brought us and put us into a freedom group because he knew what we were going to go through. We actually looked forward to going to small group every Thursday night because we knew we were going to be around people 
um, even if we had to kind of talk about what we had been through and what had happened. But you could go to your small group and you could talk to them and there was no feeling of being judged. Having a support system through the small group was, was amazing. If we didn't have action in our lives and had we not been in a freedom group when all of that stuff happened, then I, I don't know where we'd be. You know, what I found is that relationships, and in the context of our conversation today, small groups make the good times great and the tragedy is just a little more tolerable. That we just need people to link arms with. And what I found, it doesn't really matter what we're studying in those groups. It doesn't really matter what we're talking about weekly. What matters is, is that when life happens, we have people to link arms and, and fight with cry with, laugh with. Relationships are important. You know, I love Sundays. Sundays are so much fun. I think our Sundays are really, really good. The sermon's great. <laughs> but I don't even really remember what I talked about a couple weeks ago. I remember last week. Last week was good. Two weeks ago, kind of great. <laughs> How many of you could name the series we did this summer? Probably very few. It was the Holy Spirit, and it was awesome, and you should remember it. But I'm just here to tell you that, that sermons are okay, and Sundays are, 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 are okay, and they're needed, and they're a part of what we do, and, and lost people get found, and that's the most important thing. But if you are going to run with endurance, it's who you're doing life with. When I look back to life-changing moments, I don't remember a quote, and I don't remember a moment in a service. I remember a person. Most importantly, I remember when I met the person of Jesus Christ and everything changed. But I remember my pastor at 19 years old, Lane Strands, telling me things. I remember my mom and dad speaking the word of God and, and, and counseling me through things. I remember people that pointed me to Jesus and my life was never the same. Life change happens in relationship with God and in relationship with other people. Don't do life alone. Let's bow our heads at all of our locations today. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. I want to give you an opportunity right now to start the most important relationship of all, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus died as you on the cross 2,000 years ago. Took your place, perfect, sinless. The Bible calls the, the spotless lamb of God. Took on our transgressions, our sin, our shame, our mistakes. There was a trade that day. It says, if we will but confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord, that we can accept that gift and receive that relationship. If you want to do that today at any one of our locations, you say, Pastor Justin, today is my day of salvation. Today I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. Or maybe you're in here today. And like me, you grew up in church, you walked aisles, you felt the Holy Spirit goosebumps, but you would say, Pastor Justin, I've never given Jesus control of my life. He's never been number one. And today, he's going to be the most important relationship. I'm giving him my life by recommitting my faith in him. So for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time, would you slip your hand up at all of our locations? Come on, right here in Winter Springs. Come on, Sanford, we're going to raise them high so we can see them. Locations are taking their services right now. Come on, Winter Springs, just us. I got five or six. I got one in the middle, two, three in the back, a couple right here. Anybody else? Gotcha. What a moment. Right here in the middle. Gotcha, man. Proud of you. Start a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can put your hands down. Would you pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud? Say something like this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for this free gift of salvation. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner saved only by your grace. And I am confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart that you are the Lord. And I'm giving you that place today, complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Now, God, I pray for all of us. I pray that we would put you first. God, that you're going to set the ultimate pace, but we're going to surround ourselves with people to, to help. To help point to you, to help encourage us in the journey, and to, to, you're going to put people in our life that we're called to help. That God, we're going to be in relationship with you and relationship with others and run this race with endurance that you've marked out for us. We love you. We pray.
praise you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Church, can we celebrate the six or seven hands? Come on, really celebrate them. So proud of you.